Breaking news! Surely you have heard the hot news recently, Donald Trump has started selling Bibles. It's strange that a person can earn up to $6.5 billion in a day, being one of the people with the highest wealth in the world. It's hard to understand why he decided to sell the Bible. We can easily see that if he considered selling this Bible as a business, it would be truly unreasonable because selling such books is nothing compared to his income. So, what does Donald Trump really want? What is he trying to signal to the Christian? Please watch the entire video to get answers to these questions and not miss the shocking truth that I will reveal at the end of the video. In many previous videos, we have learned that Donald Trump has a special belief and mission in Jesus as well as being a Christian. I believe in God. I am Christian. But what is worth noting is that he once again asserted this issue in this year's election campaign and publicly sold Bible books with a very special title. We must make America pray again. To keep Americans protected, also the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Pledge of Allegiance are all part of this God bless the USA Bible. And it's just very important and very important to me. I want to have a lot of people have it. You have to have it for your heart, for your soul. Many of you have never read them and don't know the liberties and rights you have as Americans and how you are being threatened to lose those rights. It's happening all the time. It's a very sad thing that's going on in our country, but we're going to get it turned around. Religion and Christianity are the biggest things missing from this country. And I truly believe that we need to bring them back and we have to bring them back fast. I think it's one of the biggest problems we have. That's why our country is going haywire. We've lost religion in our country. The issue that Mr. Trump clearly raises is that religion and Christianity are the biggest things missing from this country. And I truly believe that we need to bring them back and have to bring them back quickly. And I think it's one of the biggest problems we have. That's why our country is going haywire. We've lost religion in our country. Through the bottom, we can see that Trump is trying to bring the Holy Spirit to as many people as possible in this way. His media influence is huge, not only in America, but also in the world. He is a talented person, so he easily understands what his strengths are. Even though selling Bibles like that just looked like he was doing business, it was through his media power and the words he said during the sales announcement. All combined can change many people's consciousness about the Bible, as well as bring the Bible to more people. This action truly touched the hearts of many people, and more and more people recognized him as a Christian. He spends his time making millions of dollars or implementing other projects of his own. It is truly admirable that he has a desire to make Christianity better and contribute to it. Giving lost people the way to return to Jesus, he did what few influential people could do when he openly became a Christian and dared to stand up and propagate his beliefs. Completely ignore the difficulties he may encounter when making such statements. But why, even though he declared himself a Christian for a long time, he only recently started selling Bibles and making statements like that? Did he receive a sign from God? Is he using this to signal everyone about it? To get the answer to this question, we must first go back to history and the Bible. The Abraham Accords 4,000 years ago, according to the Bible, God made a significant promise to Abraham, sealing it with what's known as the Abrahamic Covenant. This divine pact, detailed in Genesis 15:18, assured Abraham and his descendants of the land from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates, a promise of perpetual possession. Fast forward to modern times, and we witness a remarkable unfolding of events echoing this ancient covenant. The Jewish people, as the descendants of Abraham, faced a tumultuous history, including exile from their promised land after rejecting Jesus as their Messiah. For almost two millennia, they endured displacement until 1948 when Israel was reborn. However, the journey toward peace in this troubled region has been fraught with challenges. Arab nations surrounding Israel vehemently opposed its existence and resisted any acknowledgement of its right to the land. Yet, against this backdrop of animosity, glimmers of hope emerged. In 1979, Egypt, led by Anwar Sadat, defied the status quo by signing a groundbreaking peace treaty with Israel. Tragically, Sadat paid with his life for this bold move, falling victim to extremists. Nevertheless, his courage paved the way for further diplomatic breakthroughs. In 1994, Jordan followed suit, signing a peace agreement with Israel. Despite these positive steps, many Arab nations remained steadfast in their refusal to normalize relations with Israel. Then came the surprising turn of events in 2020. 
President Donald Trump, driven by a vision for peace in the Middle East, pursued a bold agenda. After years of relentless diplomacy, the Abraham Accords emerged, a historic peace agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, later joined by Bahrain. The significance of this agreement cannot be overstated. Named after the ancient covenant with Abraham, the Abraham Accords signify a recognition of Israel's right to exist in the land promised to Abraham's descendants. Interestingly, biblical prophecy intersects with these modern developments. In Daniel 9.27, a prophecy foretells the confirmation of a covenant, marking the beginning of a final seven-year period before the culmination of significant events, including the return of Jesus and the Battle of Armageddon. Could the signing of the Abraham Accords be the fulfillment of this prophecy? Some believe so. The agreement affirming Israel's rightful place in the region resonates deeply with the Abrahamic Covenant. In this context, speculation arises about the role of the Antichrist, who, according to prophecy, will confirm the covenant with many for seven years. The concept of the Antichrist is deeply rooted in biblical prophecy, particularly in the Book of Revelation and other apocalyptic texts. According to these scriptures, the Antichrist is a figure who will emerge in the end times, wielding great power and influence. While interpretations vary, many believe that the Antichrist will play a pivotal role in the events leading up to the final battle between good and evil. So, who will be the Antichrist? Delve into the intriguing intersection of biblical prophecy and contemporary geopolitics, particularly regarding the concept of the Antichrist in the context of the ongoing peace process in the Middle East. The recent peace agreements, such as the Abraham Accords, have sparked discussions among believers about their potential alignment with biblical prophecy. Central to these discussions is the notion of the Antichrist, a figure prophesied to play a significant role in the end times. However, when we examine the current players in the peace process, including President Trump's involvement, we encounter a divergence from scriptural expectations. While some speculate about individuals like Trump, scriptural evidence points to the Antichrist emerging from Europe, not the United States. Yet amidst these complexities, attention turns to the Palestinian leadership, particularly Mahmoud Abbas, and their stance on the peace negotiations. Abbas's reluctance to engage in talks led by the current administration and his preference for international mediation raises intriguing possibilities. Should Abbas's call for multilateral negotiations be heeded, involving entities like the UN, EU, Russia, and the US, it could potentially set the stage for significant developments in the peace process. Some interpretations suggest that such international involvement aligns with biblical prophecies concerning the role of the Antichrist in confirming a final covenant. Nevertheless, the identity of the Antichrist remains a mystery, and speculation must be approached with caution. While parallels between current events and biblical prophecy are thought-provoking, they do not provide definitive answers. So we should focus on the prophecy and its fulfillment. What does the prophecy tell us? Particularly focusing on Jerusalem and its significance in the grand tapestry of history and faith. The recent peace agreements, like the Abraham Accords, have captured global attention, prompting many to ponder their connection to ancient prophecies. These agreements, signed right in the heart of the White House, serve as tangible reminders of the intricate dance between geopolitics and divine design. They're like puzzle pieces falling into place, hinting at a larger, prophetic picture waiting to be unveiled. When we talk about prophecy, we're essentially peering into the future through the lens of the past. It's like having a roadmap guiding us through the twists and turns of human history. And one prophecy that's been capturing minds and hearts for centuries is found in the book of Daniel, particularly in chapter 9. Now, let's break it down. This prophecy in Daniel speaks of the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the coming of the Messiah. It's like a beacon of hope shining through the darkest of times, assuring believers that God's promises will be fulfilled no matter the odds. Jerusalem, often portrayed as a damsel in distress in biblical literature, was actually a strategic and fortified city in ancient times. Despite facing numerous onslaughts and destructions, Jerusalem endured, a testament to its resilience and divine destiny. But let's zoom in on a pivotal moment in Jerusalem's history. It's desolation by the Babylonians in 587 BCE. It was a devastating blow, with the city lying in ruins and its people scattered. Yet, amidst the rubble, a glimmer of hope emerged. You see, despite the apparent defeat, it was inconceivable that Jerusalem would remain desolate forever. Why? 
because it was intertwined with a sacred promise made by God in the Garden of Eden, a promise of redemption and restoration through the Messiah. So, even in the darkest of times, faithful believers clung to the prophecies of Jeremiah and Isaiah, which foretold Jerusalem's restoration and future glory. They knew that God's timing was perfect and His promises never faltered. Fast forward to the year 539 BCE, and we encounter a remarkable prophecy delivered by the angel Gabriel to Daniel. It's like a glimpse into the divine playbook, revealing the exact timing of the Messiah's entry into Jerusalem. The prophecy hinges on a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, a decree that would breathe new life into the city's veins. And lo and behold, in 444 BCE, King Artaxerxes of Persia issued such a decree, setting the stage for Nehemiah's mission to rebuild Jerusalem's walls. But that's not all. The prophecy doesn't just stop at the physical rebuilding of Jerusalem. It speaks of a deeper restoration, a spiritual renewal ushered in by the Messiah. It's like a symphony building to a crescendo, culminating in the triumphant entry of the long-awaited Savior into the holy city. And as we reflect on these ancient prophecies, we're reminded of the enduring power of faith and hope. Just as believers in centuries past clung to these promises amidst uncertainty and despair, so too can we find solace and assurance in God's unchanging word. So, as we journey through the pages of history and prophecy, let's keep our hearts open to the whispers of divine truth, knowing that the fulfillment of God's promises is as certain as the rising sun. And who knows? Perhaps we'll find ourselves standing on the threshold of prophecy fulfilled, witnessing the dawn of a new era of redemption and grace. What the Jews needed now. Picture this. It's almost a century after the Jews returned from Babylonian captivity and they're on the cusp of rebuilding their beloved city of Jerusalem. With the blessing of the Persian king, they have the green light to restore its walls and revive its glory. Now, pay close attention to a prophecy tucked away in the book of Daniel, a prophecy that sets the stage for one of the most profound events in human history. It speaks of a specific time frame between the issuing of a decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the arrival of the Messiah, the Prince. Here's where it gets interesting. The prophecy breaks down this time frame into weeks, but these aren't your typical seven-day weeks. No, these are weeks of years, meaning each week represents seven years. So, when the prophecy talks about seven weeks and 62 weeks, it's actually referring to 49 years and 434 years, respectively, totaling 483 years from the decree to the Messiah. Now, let's fast forward to the year 444 BCE when the Persian king issues the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. From this moment, the countdown begins, ticking away the years until the arrival of the long-awaited Messiah. But wait, there's a twist. In ancient times, the Jewish year consisted of 360 days, not 365 like our modern calendar. So to crunch the numbers, we need to convert these years into days and count them down from the decree in 444 BCE. And here's where it gets mind-blowing. When you do the math, you arrive at a precise date, March 30th, AD 33, celebrated as Palm Sunday. This is the day when Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, fulfilling the prophecy down to the very day. But let's rewind a bit to understand the historical context. The return of the Jews to Jerusalem was facilitated by Cyrus, the Persian conqueror of Babylon, fulfilling Jehovah's foretelling in 536 BCE. Under Cyrus's decree, the foundation of the temple was laid, marking a pivotal moment in Jerusalem's restoration. However, the enemy wasn't about to let Jerusalem rise without a fight. Samaritan adversaries threw up roadblocks, even securing a ban on temple construction from the Persian government. But divine providence prevailed, as prophets like Haggai and Zechariah inspired the Jewish remnant to persevere. Fast forward 15 years to the reign of Darius, another Persian king, and the temple building efforts resumed with renewed zeal. Despite opposition and legal challenges, the Jews pressed on, citing Cyrus's decree as their mandate to rebuild. Now, let's address a burning question that's puzzled scholars for centuries. Who issued the decree mentioned in Daniel's prophecy? Some argue it was Cyrus, citing prophecies in Isaiah that foretold of Cyrus's role in Jerusalem's restoration. Indeed, Cyrus's proclamation in Ezra 1, 2, 4 confirms his decree to rebuild the temple, acknowledging the command of the Lord God of heaven. 
His decree not only authorized the temple's reconstruction, but also granted the exiles permission to return to their homeland. So, whether it was Cyrus or another Persian ruler, the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy underscores the intricate tapestry of divine providence woven throughout history. From the decree to the Messiah's arrival, every detail aligns with precision, affirming the veracity of Daniel's prophetic vision. As we reflect on these ancient prophecies, we're reminded of the enduring faithfulness of God and the unfolding of His divine plan through the ages. From the ruins of Jerusalem to the triumphal entry of the Messiah, every step of the journey echoes the sovereign hand of the Almighty, guiding His people towards redemption and restoration. So, as we marvel at the intricacies of prophecy fulfilled, let's draw inspiration from the faithfulness of those who came before us, trusting in the certainty of God's promises and the hope they bring for the future. What is the evidence that Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled? In the Annals of Prophecy, Isaiah's words resonate with profound significance as they find fulfillment in the decree issued by Cyrus, the Persian king, to rebuild Jerusalem. This decree ignited the fervor of the returning Jewish exiles under the leadership of Zerubbabel, marking the dawn of a new chapter in Jerusalem's storied history. But here's where things get intriguing. Some scholars suggest that the actual rebuilding of Jerusalem was deferred until the time of Ezra, nearly a century later under the reign of King Artaxerxes. However, extra-biblical sources, such as the writings of Flavius Josephus and the apocryphal book of 1 Esdras, paint a different picture. These sources recount the early stages of Jerusalem's rebuilding, contradicting the notion of a delayed restoration. Josephus, in particular, offers insight into Cyrus's intentions to fulfill the prophecies of Isaiah, expressing his earnest desire to assist the Jews in rebuilding their city and temple. Despite Cyrus's goodwill, opposition from the Samaritans and other adversaries hindered the rebuilding efforts, prompting delays and setbacks during his reign. However, buoyed by divine favor and unwavering determination, the Jewish remnant persevered, spurred on by prophets like Haggai and Zechariah. Despite continued opposition, including bureaucratic hurdles and outright hostility, the temple was completed in less than five years, a testament to the indomitable spirit of God's chosen people. But let's pivot to the heart of prophecy, the fulfillment of Daniel's vision concerning the arrival of the Messiah. According to Daniel's precise calculations, the countdown from Cyrus's decree to the Messiah's appearance culminated in the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, precisely as foretold. Yet beyond this pivotal moment lies a deeper mystery, a prophecy foretelling the final seven years, a period teeming with prophetic fulfillment and divine intervention. During this time, Israel's third temple will rise on the hallowed grounds of the Temple Mount, ushering in a resurgence of ancient rites and sacrifices. However, amidst the temple's completion, a shadow looms, the rise of the Antichrist. This enigmatic figure will deceive many, proclaiming himself as the Messiah and instigating the abomination of desolation, a sacrilege that triggers the onset of the Great Tribulation. But amidst the darkness, a flicker of hope emerges. God's two witnesses, heralds of truth and righteousness, who will lead a mighty revival amidst the chaos of the Great Tribulation. Their ministry will spark a spiritual awakening igniting the hearts of both Jews and Gentiles, as foretold in the book of Revelation. Yet as the tribulation intensifies, the Antichrist's true nature is revealed, culminating in a final showdown at the Battle of Armageddon. It is here that Jesus, the true Messiah, will return in glory, vanquishing the forces of darkness and establishing His earthly kingdom for a thousand years of peace and righteousness. In the tapestry of prophecy, every thread finds its place, weaving a narrative of divine providence and human destiny. From the rebuilding of Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah, every event unfolds according to God's sovereign plan, guiding humanity towards its ultimate redemption. So, as we navigate the complexities of prophecy, let us heed its warnings and embrace its promises. For in its pages, we find hope, purpose, and the assurance of God's unchanging faithfulness throughout the ages. As we draw our journey through prophecy to a close, let us reflect on the profound truths we've uncovered and the mysteries we've explored. From the rebuilding of Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah, each revelation serves as a testament to the timeless wisdom and unfailing faithfulness of God. As we navigate the tumultuous currents of our world, let us anchor our souls in the promises of prophecy, finding solace in the knowledge that God's plans are unfolding according to His perfect timing. May we walk forward with courage, hope, and steadfast faith, 
knowing that the God who guided his people through the ages is the same God who leads us today. So, as we part ways, let us carry with us the lessons of prophecy, lessons of trust, perseverance, and the enduring power of God's love. And may we continue to journey onward, ever mindful of the signs and wonders that point us towards the fulfillment of God's ultimate purpose for His creation. Thank you for joining me on this exploration of prophecy. Until we meet again, may the peace and blessings of God be with you always.